one of our presentations kind of dropped out. So. Yeah, we have enough time. Hi, everybody. This is the IATF 118 IoT operations session. It's Thursday. It's a pretty late. It's 5 p.m. local time. I hope everybody around the world is more or less happy with that and can present uh, in full state of mind. Um, having said that, I'm Hank. And, I'm and exactly. And uh, we will be your co chairs today. So there's a note well that uh, some of you know well. Uh, this is about content. So whenever you say something, you will be recorded in this room. There are cameras. If you do not like to, do not like to be on the camera, please uh, stay out of their point of view. And also do not speak up. Uh, that is basically the only way not to be recorded here. There will also be um, IP um, um, implication when you say something. There are a lot of BCPs here you can click at. There's also the note very well that is not on the slide deck, which is about uh, uh, conduct, not a content. So uh, whenever you feel that something is not going well in a, in a um, human to human perspective behavior, like treat others like you want to be treated yourself and such, you can approach the chairs, the ADs, or the other people like the ombudsman. So please uh, do not hesitate to point something out that is not visible to us because we want to like to improve uh, always on the atmosphere and the, and the community here. There's a meet echo. Um, uh, it is very important that everybody in the room either scans this QR code or goes to the uh, agenda site and clicks on the camera icon, which is the full Meet Echo client. Um, that's for registering the blue sheets. Blue sheets are a thing of the past, although we have one that again would have that QR code on it. So we are not, we are passing that around. Um, having said that, that helps us to estimate how many people are in the room and for planning ITFs in the future. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, one specific link here on this slide that I want to point out that is issues. We have a new Meet Echo tool uh, that's pretty cool. Uh, on my side, sometimes it's a little bit flaky, so I will file an issue. If you find something that is wrong with the systems that the, the IT services we provide here, um, please follow that link and file an issue yourself. That really also helps us. Um, there's also a, a procedural point here that is called Note Taker. On the agenda side for the IoT operations work uh, session here, there is the uh, uh, note taking link. We need a note taker that has to come from the audience. And this is a, oh, Michael. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I was about to explain that note taker is less work than people think it is, but you know, thank you, Michael. Michael already knows. <laughs> Which means crisp notes. Um, I th think that is what I heard. <laughs> Again, uh, I'm Hank, this is Alexei. Uh, we just got um, through all the items which are basically minutes and meeting material. If you not have read anything, if this is too far away, there's uh, meeting material available on the data tracker so you can have it on your own screen. Um, there's agenda for today. So basically the five minutes I've already taken up. And um, yeah, basically before I'm reading out an agenda aloud, I'd say we have a small agenda bash. Um, which is the second item, right? Yeah. Yeah, so the comparison of co-op security protocols are both Francesca and John are not available for the, this time slot, unfortunately. So this will be uh, gone. We will mic have uh, open mic uh, at the end or... Yeah. And they basically said <laughs> they need to do a new revision of the document. They are waiting for information, for, for extra data to be incorporated. Uh, any, oh, uh, show the next slide. It's the end of the agenda. Any other agenda bashing, mm -hmm. swapping, anything? Okay. Excellent. Going back to the first item, uh, I think Brandon is up. I have not checked the attendee list, but I am assuming Brandon is there. Uh, and he is. Brandon, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Excellent. Yes, I can. Um, <laughs> it would have been a little bit shorter. So I will select your slide deck. Um, I hope. Yes. 
Okay. There we go. Uh, this one's been going around for uh, a few a few times now. Um, it's getting there, I think. Uh, next slide, please. So um, we've got a few changes, but the the bulk of it really is just that um, I've added in the Etsy cybersecurity for consumer Internet of Things baseline requirements. Um, this has added uh, a fair number of new requirements to the mapping. Um, there was a surprising result. We hadn't covered all of them yet. Um, maybe we've got them now. I'm not sure. Uh, that'll take uh, probably someone checking if there's another baseline requirements document and comparing it against. Uh, next slide, please. So there is quite a lot of overlap with the existing ANISA uh, draft that was already in there and the NIST draft. Um, this one has more of a focus on consumer IoT devices, and that has some implications on the data protection requirements. Uh, obviously, in corporate deployments, data protection is not the same issue as it is in consumer IoT deployments, so it's a bit different. Um, it also had substantially more uh, requirements on update and more resilience requirements. Next slide, please. All right, so where we stand today, we have three separate sets of uh, baseline requirements. Uh, they all call themselves baseline requirements, amazingly. I'm, I'm, I am very curious to know what they left out. Uh, there's a lot in there. Um, the question to the working group, honestly, from this point is what's left to do? We have three different mappings, which together are pretty thorough. I wouldn't be surprised if there were some wording changes and some uh, editorial cleanup needed, but in terms of overall content, are we done yet? And if not, what's left? Next slide, please. Um, Right, what else does this draft need? Uh, I have had one offer from someone to, to give it a look, but um, other than that, if anyone wants to help out, that would be very welcome. Um, if anyone has uh, suggestions for what's needed in the draft, that would be very welcome. Uh, let me know what's needed and let's get it done. Okay, thank you, Brent. So, uh, first item that I I think I heard is, um, I, I want to tone it down. The first option: Are you asking for reviewers that will absolutely, absolutely? So, I'm looking in the room here right now. So, Hannes is raising his hand carefully. <laughs> that is, his, yeah, no, that is nice. I mean, <laughs> I mean, um, we can use the tool. Yeah, I mean. The tool is an anonymous um, way to um, indicate that there might be more than one. Um, without, I, I, do we want this to be anonymous? Is... Don't we want people to to uh, to be held to what they say they'll do? I know it's a bit pointless for this one. But yeah, but, but let's it's it's a it's a fun fun exercise. So let's let's, let's do this. So um... So why that we had this go on for like a few seconds. So why typically uh, the ask is, could the one person say why they are not doing it? I will not do that. <laughs> of course yeah, not. Of course. <laughs> The attrition rate we really need double of this probably. I, and I didn't vote. Oh, you didn't vote? Oh. Yeah, so so it's seven. Seven, excellent. Anybody eight? Eight? Anybody? Eight? <laughs> no, it's Nine? fine. <laughs> so I, no. is, is there is there anybody, and this is okay to say no, I, let's find also to say no on the poll right now. Uh, anybody um, willing to um, reveal themselves as a reviewer so we can make a note of that? So that, I know that's a little bit more of a commitment than an anonymous um, yes, but I'm still trying. The room is smiling. 
in general. Yes, okay. So okay, we have uh, we have uh, uh, intention. There, there's intention here. We will stop the poll. And um, Brendan, we will hope for the best. Also, the um, the uh, updated uh, ID. Um, could you summarize some of the updates on the list? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I will pass a summary of updates onto the list. I didn't want to bog down the slides with a massive list of changes because I think that honestly would have detracted from the overall, which is there's three separate baseline requirements incorporated now. Uh, if there are more that need to be in there and you know what they are, please feel free to add them and be an, an author um, or tell me and I'll, we'll see what we can do. Oh, excellent. And Ray wanted to ask? Uh, one comment? Uh, no. Uh, um, I, I raised my hand for willing um, to do the review. And uh, besides of that, uh, I noticed that uh, um, there is ETSI uh, requirements are included in this draft. And uh, it was published in ETSI TC Cyber. And I happen to have another um, project in, in TC Cyber. So I may uh, advertise this uh, draft in there and uh, seek some feedback from there. Thank you. Perfect. Excellent. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you for amplifying. That is uh, the best way to do it. Okay, Brendan, thanks for your presentation. I will uh, switch to the next deck, which is not the one I'm thinking it is. Can you tell me what the next icon is? And we're skipping one. Uh, on this TLS, DTLS. Mm -hmm. Next one, I can do. The next one is Francesca, who is not here. Yeah, you might that's the one yeah, that yeah. we kind of skip skipping. Okay, <clears throat> and here you go. Okay. Um, it's actually not a document in this group, uh, but I thought this would be a good audience to provide us feedback. And so that's why I asked the chairs to get a few minutes and uh, they kindly agreed that, uh, that this would be a good idea. Okay, next slide. So since uh, you may have not followed that work uh, to begin with, I thought that I should give a very brief summary on what it is. Um, there was a document developed in the Utah Working Group focused on profiles for DLS and DTLS 1.2, um, which sort of like had the intention to describe what type of uh, credential types and what type of uh, extension, what type of optimizations you should be using when using the DLS and DTLS uh, in a constrained IoT environment based on like what we have seen in other specifications, uh, what was done in, in stacks, in protocol stacks, and also what um, other organizations have been doing. And that work was published in RFC 7925, so a little while ago already. Um, and there are uh, luckily lots of deployments uh, available of DLS and DTLS in those environments um, following that guidance. And then, of course, as time progressed and uh, the DLS working group worked on the version 1.3 of the, of the protocol, we started to update that guidance. And uh, it's shorter than the previous version because there are obviously fewer extensions available. Many things have been addressed already in the core specification. So that's a great thing. Um, and now with uh, DTLS 1.3 also being published, um, it's, it was in, or the document is in, is in pretty good uh, shape. Um, obviously, it follows the guidance that was done previously, so it's not completely out of context, but you follows up on, on, on that prior work. Okay, next slide. Um, recently, uh, we've got an extensive review from Michael, uh, and we've started to address some of it, uh, probably halfway there. Um, had a lot of changes in the documents, specifically related to the X549 certificate profile, which was also part of the original recommendation, but was a much shorter section. Because obviously, when you are um, using X549 certificates uh, as one of the credential types, typically in, with mutual authentication, you have to deal with the questions about what, how do you populate the fields in 
the CA certificate in the subordinate uh, certificates, CA certificates, and also in the end entity certificates for the device, uh, the server side is, is addressed already in other uh, documents that were published earlier with uh, Utah. And um, while doing that update, obviously we had uh, ran out of time a little bit. Um, and the others are tracked in this issue tracker over here, which is um, in the repository, GitHub repository. Okay, next slide. I won't go through all the issues, but uh, instead I, would I want to focus on the certificate profile topic. Uh, I, I won't talk, uh, talk about the, the DLS specific extensions. Um, so what the certificate profile did in the past and is still doing is it focuses on uh, certificates based on elliptic curve cryptography, uh, which is sort of the recommended approach for IoT devices due to their size. Um, we, not, we have previously used or borrowed some of the IEEE 802.1AR terminology, um, but now we have done that more extensively. And specifically, I'm, I'm sure you're all familiar with that terminology, this um, IDEF IDs and LDEF ID uh, terminology. The guidance in there focuses currently on LDEF IDs, on these locally significant uh, device identifiers, rather than the manufacturer provisioned ones, because those are actually, as we will hear later in the, in the session when um, Chuff is going to talk about FDO, there are already guidelines available on how to populate um, certificates and, and different specifications like Anima Prisky and, and um, yeah, a couple of other organizations have worked on these onboarding protocols or um, they provide guidance for those IDF IDs. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, so one, so I picked a few items of those. So if you look through the, the latest version of the document, it's a longer um, description. Um, I picked a few where there is, uh, so where we would appreciate a little bit of feedback where we, uh, where we rely a little bit on more than what we saw, uh, but also maybe you ha have been deploying um, some of those IoT devices or, or your company did. So if you, um, just as a, uh, out of curiosity, so um, just to check uh, who in the room has actually been using X509 certificates on their IoT deployments. Uh, so you see uh, a bunch of hands, that's excellent. Can I, can I just, sorry. Yeah, Elliot, of course. Uh, sorry, just a quick comment, it's required in matter. It's, it's, it's actually required in matter that you have. That yeah, you but not everyone does it in uses does. matter. Uh, and, um, and that was Elliot Leo speaking. Yeah. <laughs> who, who in panic jumped up to the, but uh, yeah, I just wanted to check like, what is the audience I'm talking to here? Uh, um, and so, so a good number of people actually do that already. So uh, you may, you're going to be target of uh, questions that I have later in the deck. Um, so, one of the things, um, uh, one important aspect is the validity of the certificates. And so needless to say um, is that IoT devices often have no uh, reliable time source. Uh, so which makes the uh, validation of the certificate uh, difficult. Um, and so what uh, manufacturers have been doing in the past and, and still do is they use this special value in certificates to indicate that they have no expiry time. And they do that for end entity certificate to avoid the case that the device sits in the shelf floor for an extended period of time and then gets shipped and then nothing works. Um, and so that's kind of cool uh, in some sense. Um, however, it also has the implication that you have to do the same for the rest of the chain as well, which then creates the question about how the heck are you doing a revocation? And since we are not mandating uh, OCSP nor CRLs, um, and nobody's because nobody's using them. Um, the text talks about um, kind of in, in soft language there that the certificate management protocols that are being used on those devices, typically in context of a device management protocol, um, are kind of the way to update those certificates and to deal with uh, in quote revocation. Uh, so you can update trust anchors and you also can 
um, uh, provision new uh, certificates to the device, uh, for example, these uh, LDAP IDs. So uh, that's what we have in there, but we would like to hear whether that sort of matches your experience or, or whether you have a totally different um, take on this. But uh, yeah, that, it, it's not ideal, uh, but yeah, it is what it is. Um, oh, Chris, yeah. Do you want questions right away? So, yeah, 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 yeah. Go yeah, ahead. yeah, come in. Just fitting the pattern. Uh, Christian, I'm just, um, on the time source topic, there's also a document I have in T2TRG um, on rate time, basically about what devices can do to help here. Um, let's talk offline more about that. Yeah, the rough time? No, um, uh, no, rate time. It's a complete, it's a different we, thing oh, for okay. completely offline situations. Oh, that sounds, sounds interesting. Yeah. Yeah, maybe there's something we can uh, suggest for the future. Maybe there's some, some good uh, idea. The rough time uh, work is also um, newer, um, kind of. Elliot. Yeah, so on, OC, on OCSP, does it make sense to have a little bit of a discussion about the direction of authentication and who should be doing OCSP stapling or, or can that um, ameliorate some of the situation? Yeah, that's, these, yeah, that's actually a very good point. Um, um, so in, with OCSP stapling, the idea was that the device actually does the stapling and then sends these, uh, or I, no, it's actually not, is that true? No, actually, no, it's, uh, it's the, the other way around. The, ser server, server the, sends the server sends the stapled. Uh, um, the issue there is that many of these constraint devices don't have a lot of communication partners to begin with. Uh, and when you do the stapling, if it's unsuccessful, typically you talk to your device management server. And if you, if you do that, and it's, um, it turns out that the certificates that you get ha are revoked or have other issues, then what are you, what are you supposed to do? So it, it's, it's um, the document doesn't mandate any of this, uh, but the problem is what do you, how do you recover from the whole situation when the management server you are talking to actually has revoked certificates? And that's a question that uh, was discussed in the context of e uh, TLS 1.3 as well, um, which was, a, in my opinion, a little bit of controversial discussion. Um, and, and I don't, in many of the stacks that embedded the stacks don't even support OCSP stapling to begin with, uh, which sort of makes me believe that it's not so widely used either. Let me follow up here just a moment. What, what I'm thinking actually is this is something that it may require a little bit more development thought, but um, the, the, the recommendations are a little bit on the sweeping side in this case. And mm -hmm. to try and it may be that case that we need some bits in terms of when to use and when not to use what this, you know, to try mm -hmm. and, and give some guidance on the circumstances around that. Yeah. Yeah. I just don't have the, I don't have the story worked out on when you would be using it. Yeah. Um, so a good example, right. Is for e in the, in the EPTLS discussion, right. Yeah. If, if you're doing OCS, OCSP stapling and you don't even have IP connectivity, right? What do you do, right? That's that's a big issue. It's, it's like, yeah, it's, but it's be beyond that, right? As you're getting into more application level aspects, it yeah. may, then it becomes very circumstance specific. Maybe, yeah, maybe. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's certainly. Michael Richardson. Um, so um, I actually think the story for the expiry time for the root CAs and the subordinate CAs is different between IDEV ID and LDEV ID, right? Sure. So an IDEV ID, probably you need infinity. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, it's possible to roll your root CA and re-sign subordinate CAs, that link, yeah. provided you can get that thing out, that trust anchor out to your customers mm -hmm. at the right time. And depending on other things that, that, maybe easy or hard. It's even possible to, for the subordinate CAs to, to re-sign the end entity certificates, but that's a little bit weirder where you get this expired certificate and then you go get something that has the same public key and it's mm -hmm. the same, yeah. but it's conceivable that we could do that, it, it is. right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Sorry? Yeah. yeah. And the LDEV ID side of things, which is the operational private PKI of the enter of the organization. In EST, at least, we have the ability 
to actually do that. And we even referenced like there's an age old thing where you have old root CA signs new one and new mm -hmm. one signs old one. Mm -hmm. and if anyone actually has code that does that, I have no idea. But we have that mechanism out mm -hmm. there and we have in EST that ability to go and get a new certificate at the halfway point. And we even put that into the um, EST over co-op and we said how to do it efficiently so you didn't have to have too many things. Mm -hmm. So I think that a lot of that stuff is possible and we could, so we could have rather than um, infinite lifetimes on LDEV IDs, we could have shortish lifetimes, right? However, if you, you know, there's a lot of clickbaity webinars out there talking about the time bomb in your IoT deployment. Mm -hmm. I've seen multiple talks where they're basically telling you how you shouldn't use certificates or something, and they have some magic, you know, uh, thing that's going to solve your problem. But the problem case is real, and I think that the that I think that um, I think we have a real a real tussle here, right? Because you you many cases you just don't ever want those things to ever expire, and you, you know as you say, what do you do? Or Elliot said, what do you do if you don't get a staple because it turns out that you know you're an elevator and you've been revoked? Uh, what what do you do? Right? Stop operation? Do you flash a light? Does someone come and maintain you? I think it totally depends on the context. And so I don't think we're going to ever have good advice here, except that I think that we, we could document the tussle, right? And say, this is an unresolved issue, the A, the B. I just wanted to say that the other part was that um, I had some conversations with some of the authors of 8021AR because it's very weak on a lot of things about what goes into the certificates very, yeah. and so we wind up. So the question is, we could do uh, a IoT, an IoT profile in the, IO, in the IETF of 8021AR, where we actually nail down some of these things, in particular, uh, the serial numbers, uh, the, 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 not the certificate serial numbers, the, the product serial numbers, mm. okay, and where they go and what goes on. And there's a wide variety across the industry right now of how this works. And it would, we could easily get some standard. And I think it's a case of no one's going to fix their stuff unless someone says, please adhere to RFC 4782 and, or something. So. Yeah. Um, on, on, on the former point uh, regarding LDF IDs and the time, I think one of the challenges is when you don't have a reliable, when, when you don't have a time source to begin with, devices have sort of uh, have connectivity that may be intermittent. Um, and so you may run into, into problems that you sort of self-inflicted by uh, issuing uh, certificates which have too short of a line of lifetime. But uh, Probably we should distinguish between devices that are really constrained in, in as we talk about them in, in a number of the groups versus devices which are IoT devices, but more like the classical embedded Linux where you have uh, NTP in some form and, and, and everything is, uh, is cool. Um, where you still have some, maybe some networks where the bandwidth is uh, uh, an issue, etc. I think maybe that uh, probably reflects what well, covers the comment that you had earlier to distinguish the different cases um, yeah. on, on the other, on the one AR specification type of thing. Um, I'm not sure I, I have the appetite to, to do that, to be honest. Um, but, but as I will have later in my slide deck, if, if it works out time-wise, um, um, I, I will actually talk about these, um, this uh, subject name and uh, subject alt name issue, which is another point that is difficult. So, but Elliot, you wanted to say something. Okay, okay. Oh, Gary, um, Gary, you go ahead. Yeah, don't mind the three minutes. We'll we'll give you more time. Thank okay. you. Yeah, I, 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 uh, do you, Hank, you can hear me, right? Yes, yeah. it works. Okay, hey, Hannes, you can hear me. Yeah, no, I was asked to elaborate on a comment that I put in into the uh, into the chat window. Um, like with the elevator example, a lot of uh, a lot of IoT devices aren't internet connected. 
and therefore OCSC, OCSP stapling is, you know, it's pretty much a non-starter. What I've seen in a lot of IoT devices, and Hannes, given your previous life, you may have seen this, is, um, is uh, executing cert revocation as part of the secure boot cycle. So as part of a trusted firmware download, uh, management of the uh, management of any, tr uh, what I've seen in IoT devices is actually management of trusted routes. Those trusted routes are related to firmware validation, but um, there, there's no reason they can't be used, that same mechanism cannot be used for, uh, uh, for uh, general cert management and even whether they be uh, root certs or intermediate certs. So it's not as good as an OCSP stapling because it's OCSP stapling, you get timely information, but with an IoT device, you can actually compel an IoT device, for instance, to not operate or, 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 unless a, for, unless a uh, firmware upgrade takes place on a, on a periodic basis. Like the elevator example, maybe force a firmware upgrade for, a, a, you know, on a Saturday every weekend, one weekend every month. So uh, I think that there are alternatives and there need to be alternatives for devices that aren't RP, IP connected. Uh, yeah. That was, that was basically what I was, uh, what I was commenting on in the chat window. Yeah. Thanks Gary. That's a, that's a, that's a good comment. Yeah. We should, um, I will update it, the, the document to, to cover that too. And in some sense it reflects specifically when it comes to the trust anchors, it reflects uh, what the practice that is also done in a, in a browser world where you have the, the trust anchors, part of the, the whole software bundle. In this case, the software bundle is, is often sort of like the firmware plus then, um, or the bootloader and then some application firmware on top of it. Uh, so it definitely, I think it sounds a little bit weird, um, but then when you think about it, it actually makes a lot of sense in this context. Uh, it's just a different mechanism to update code and configuration data. Okay, next slide. Oh, okay. Uh, different topic, key usage um, in, so we weren't quite sure what to write about the key usage. So there's obviously a lot of, uh, there are two fields, um, key usage and the extended key usage. And they are, and there are lots of values you can populate it with um, one of the, and it kind of makes sense to indicate that in the certificate on what it is actually used for. On the other hand, um, if you update uh, a device to, for example, to use a switch from, or you change the some cryptographic protocol at the application layer, instead of you just do signing, you use a chem suddenly, then that needs to be reflected in, in the key usage as well. So this is something where you can um, trick yourself a little bit if you're not careful, if you don't put the right key usage in there, you may end up um, sort of later uh, and down the road prevent certain usages of the key, which you initially didn't envision. Um, we still uh, put a recommendation forward, which is kind of uh, aligned with what we had previously in the document, but also uh, covering some of the 1AR use cases, and, and um, which I summarized here. And in, in essence, um, for, the, uh, for the root cert, we have uh, the key usage is, is, uh, may not be set. Uh, there's a should on the, on the key usage and, and the must not on the extended key usage. For the subordinate uh, uh, certificate, we indicate uh, key usage for, for uh, signature and, and cert signing uh, has to be used. But then for the end entity, I think that's where it makes um, most sense to put some restric restrictions in place, particularly here if you have multiple different certificates for different purposes. and. And uh, um, I added the reference to Michael's document from the oh, exactly on on the taxonomy of uh, manufacturer trust anchors um, to to cover sort of like some of that big background material for the reader. So, question again to you: like in your deployments, did you use or see? the key usage field being uh, used or do, do we go a little bit overboard here? This may be uh, the borderline between what would be, what the intention was in the PKX community versus um, sort of deployment reality where people are a little bit hesitant to put all sorts of information in there that may then later turn out to be counterproductive. Uh, any feedback on that? Um, 
you want a small anonymous call for this? Um, no, I, 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 th I think I could put it on, on the mailing list as well. It no. doesn't seem to be at the, um, okay, next one. Uh, this is the, the, the other point I mentioned before and which um, is difficult uh, in the original um, sort of guideline document, we recommended the use. So we, we had this naive perception that we could actually recommend something and then the market would pick it up in terms of what would go into the uh, subject slash subject alt name. Uh, and we suggested EUI 64 uh, to be used. Um, that was um, turned out to be incorrect. And so we are updating it uh, and lifting uh, the requirements of, or the, the, the text quite a bit. And we essentially acknowledge that there are many different ways uh, of what specifications and, and companies put into the subject or subject alt name. And we discuss a few of them. And the, and, and the ones we discuss is obviously still the EUI 64. We talk about the device serial numbers that um, Michael spoke about earlier and where to place them. The domain names um, as well and um, we specifically singled out the hardware module name uh, of DPMs because um, this is something um, which is described in 1AR, but um, I don't think it's, 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 a, it's a good recommendation. And since the references, or there may be the perception that we just copy things, but it's, uh, in this regard, it's actually a deviation. But there are lots of other uh, identifiers being um, specified, like lightweight M2M, uh, specification, for example, has a long laundry list of uh, identifiers from UUIDs, NAIs, uh, EMAs, and, and so on and so on. And it would be interesting to learn about what people actually use in practice on which, one, which identifiers they have been uh, using and think that they are actually providing a lot of value, value to them. Uh, OPC UA uses uh, URLs um, and like everyone seems to be uh, using something different. Is there something we can really do beyond what we have now in the document? Alex? Sorry, I, I'm going to abuse my, I'm not going to run there, but uh, as a participant, okay. uh, can you elaborate a little bit on the uh, subject called name must not contain multiple names? What's the reason for that? Well, this is, this is um, for the device, uh, for the device itself, uh, not for, for the server side. Um, so, but you can use different types of subject those names. I could use different. Uh, the way it's written, it's like you know, you have to pick one of the things listed, and that's it. At least the way I read it. Okay. Sorry. Thanks. Uh, if you do use different, no, that, that's not the way how we bought it. Or is it only limited no, to no, the no, domain names? No, you mean like just a single domain name? Is that all oh, right? Yeah. Okay, fine. Okay. But you can have subject alt names of different types, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. fine. Okay, thank you. But, but have one of them. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Right. That's fine. That's, that's fine. And that's on fine. one side, it can't, it probably isn't a DNS ID or it may not be a DNS ID. That's it fine. might yeah. be something else. Yeah. I hope it's, uh, I need to double check whether that's clear in the document though. Um, yeah, you got me on that one. Good. <laughs> I'll take it. Um, I think it would be very interesting to understand the use cases. So I don't think many IoT devices should or ought to have a DNS ID, but there are some interesting ways of using them. Um, but um, if you're not doing that and you're not doing a serial X520 serial number in this the DN, mm -hmm. right? Uh, then I'd be really interested to know what exactly you're putting in the other places and why, and it would be interesting to, to document that. And I think that I think one of the reasons why you would have multiple names of different types, maybe, okay, like general name and other name and whatever, um, is because you're using the same IDEV ID with a variety of onboarding protocols and each have their own particular requirements. And so far, we don't have anybody that I know of who has said you must put a DNS ID of ABC and someone else has said you must have a DNS name of not ABC. And so of course you can't build an IDEV ID with both of them, right? At this point, it looks like you could build an IDEV ID that could satisfy all of the available enrollment protocols and you could be maximally mm. inclusive. 
but we could easily trip uh, that way if someone started doing things. So mm -hmm. I, it would be nice, actually, if we wound up as the collection of, you know, come here and let us know what you're doing. Um, but I would love to hear from other things, right. what else goes mm -hmm. there. It would be nice if recommendations that include 10 different types, right? That's what you're saying, yeah. Well, I mean, it's okay, as long as they're not mutually exclusive. Right. Yeah. And yeah, don't take I'm, 16 kilobytes or something, exactly. right? Yeah, I wonder how we get that information because um, like there's, it's one, we could obviously look at different specifications and see what is being recommended there. But unfortunately, it's not necessarily what is actually used. Uh, like there's, there's a subset of it used, maybe used differently. And then there's all these other things that are being used. Um, it's, it's sort of like, how do I do that? And like just asking into the room uh, or somewhere on a mailing list, uh, I, I, like, I don't, I don't know how this would be uh, actionable, but I, I, I yeah. So I, uh, we could create a registry. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a result, we could poke people that are doing something else and say, could you put that in that registry and point to your document over there that says what you're doing? And it wouldn't be mandatory because obviously X509 lets you do whatever you like, but there are some things that we could do that would kind of imply that you should come to the IETF and tell us what you're doing because, you know, this is, we kind of, we kind of manage all the PKIC stuff now, not the ITU. Right. Anyway, I don't know. I don't know. I just say, how yeah. would it be actionable? Maybe yeah. other people have some ideas, mm. right? David, what are you using? Or you can't say? Uh, it's not that I can't say. Just that security is a domain and I'm not concerned. Sorry, I have to, I have to say, answers have to go to the mic. I'm, I'm so sorry. And please introduce your name. I know you are coerced, but still. Thank you, uh, thank you, David. David, for no. volunteering. So no. security is a domain is a domain for experts, and I do not consider myself an expert. And I rely on other people that are at the office currently. So I ask them, but I cannot answer you right now. Okay. But still, thank you for getting up. <laughs> so we'll come back to him, uh, to David, a little later. <laughs> Any, anyone who could provide a little bit of feedback on what they have seen uh, being used? Um, you know, I, I no, you, you choose good. Okay, just introduce this is Dave Robin. Hi, um, I hate I didn't want to get up because my, my our usage is so simple. I hear all these different ways of doing things, and we simply encode a URI using our URL scheme, the scheme uh -huh. that is not back, that is not um, HTTP, it okay. is over IP, but it's a custom scheme that most people aren't familiar with, but that is how we identify our products in BACnet, the building automation protocol, uh, okay. it's what I represent. Uh -huh. So every certificate has the BACnet colon slash slash one, two, three, four. And that's it. That's the device ID mm -hmm. that's found dynamically using a variety of mechanisms to bind. And then once you find him, then you confirm, am I really talking to you? So we, we, we started with GUIDs. We started with all kinds of fancy stuff. Yeah. And we said, wait a minute, everything has this numeric ID that somebody went to great pains to make unique. It's a 22-bit thing. Yeah. Just use that. Mm -hmm. So it seems very simple. But our certificate simply says, you or I in the sand. And do you use uh, three, four. Okay. We and do you... use the SAN. That is the ID because we don't have DNS names. They're, they're, yeah, that's okay. Right, right. You know, that's okay. Thousands of them on the wall. Yeah. Nobody wants to give them DNS names. That's and they find each other yeah. using this well, building um, protocol. We so. don't require uh, like uh, DNS names here. There are right. different schemes. Uh, but you essentially take kind of, uh, it's almost like a serial number for the device. And that, when it's certificate. Well, it's an assigned number. It's not a, it it's, oh, it's, a, it's, it's an, it's a generated, it's, it's, it's a signed it's, number. It's and you, it's an ID. Yeah, it is. Oh, it's clearly an LDEV ID. Yeah, but it's, in, in, and it's encoded as a uh, URL. Yes. It's okay. URI. Uh, using, URI. Using the URI uh, SAN. Form. Okay. Ah, okay. Right. So anyway, it's a simple, simple example. Oh, yes. But uh, send us an example to, to the list. Uh, yeah. Like, is that part of, like, you for, just follow the specification or are you... The, whatever the backnet the, specification is yes 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 uh -huh, right. uh -huh. so when you submit it um for you to the ca you either include the sand and they bless it or 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 you don't and they add it mm -hmm. so right you know 
an example would be great because then we can uh, add that. Maybe, maybe what Michael suggested is not that bad after all uh, to actually have that kind of registry or so. No. Okay, mm -hmm. because otherwise, like it becomes difficult to like maintain a list. Um, but okay, cool. Uh, yeah, I had earlier this year I had implemented some OPC OA uh, extensions or the way how OPC OA puts uh, their URLs into the uh, X five four nine certificate. That was again a totally different way of doing things. Um, anyway, um, okay. Any other? Anyone else? Uh, Christian, did did you see some uses? Uh, Nobody uses X509 in your circles? Um, actually not, but not, nothing of that is operational yet. So okay. no, can't be sure. Okay. Cool, yeah. Okay, uh, I will drop a mail to the list and maybe get some more feedback. Um, okay, Please. cool. And did I have one more slide or am I done? Oh yeah, you have to know. Oh, get, yeah, yeah, actually that's uh, quite important. So, um, so like if you have experience with uh, any of those things that I mentioned here, IoT deployments, uh, embedded impl uh, DLS, uh, DTLS implementations where obviously those X509 certificates are used or with certificate management uh, solutions, then um, you, you definitely have the right expertise we are looking for. And uh, we're hoping to get some, some reviews of the document. Uh, so that would be uh, a time for an anonymous <laughs> yeah, I'm actively doing that. Okay, cool. Uh -huh. So maybe we've uh, recruit someone here, but I will also ask on the mailing list um, because we would like to get more uh, so feedback and and. I will do it too. Yeah. So okay. we will start with uh, reviewing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you need to be specific about which document. Yeah. yeah, I know, but I have to also. That's a very small field here. Don't yeah, don't yeah. don't run away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is basically, I guess I got it right. Oh, yeah. All right. <clears throat> yes. Or later. <laughs> Who was it? Oh. So the, Please mention Thomas uh, explicitly in the meeting minute as a reviewer. I singled him out. Oh. <laughs> I will also provide you examples. Excellent. Okay, Thomas overpromised. <laughs> Sorry, I'm this. It's late. Cool. Yeah. Anyone else like who want to like raise their hand because they said yes I hear. Yeah, Dave. You would so so adding Elliot. I, Elliot yeah. raised his hand as well. Adding oh. Dave, Elliot, and Michael to the list. Uh oh. Yeah. By, by Friday, you will know until the next ITF, you will uh, have right. forgotten. <laughs> I keep, uh, so it's not WebEx, so how could you do it? Yes, of course. Um, <laughs> so the, yeah, the issue that I was going to raise is uh, you, you make the comment about in, in the draft about um, the uh, TLS 1.3 1, 1 supports PFS in all of its suites. First of all, that's not true. Um, there are suites that do not support PFS, uh, in particular uh, RFC 9150. Um, and second of all, there what may was be, 9150 again? It is a static DH uh, crypto suite. It's obviously not recommended. Oh, oh okay. But it's there, and it, but it's there for a reason. Actually. That was that was the but it, that, okay. That was the independent submit along the it's independent, an independent submission, submission but it's okay. still a suite. It's still, it's still mm -hmm. yeah. And there's actually a reason for it to be there. Um, and I think it actually. So I think it would be good for you to sit down with maybe Nancy and actually Thomas Werner, I think, or, or, and Stefan Fries. So mm -hmm. I think with Stefan Fries, right? Right, right, right. So I think mm -hmm. on that issue, it's probably worth a few uh, comments mm -hmm. in the in the work, not to necessarily encourage the use of of RFC 9150 in, in all cases, mm -hmm. but there are specific cases where it where that use case was felt to be necessary. 
mm -hmm. in, in order to, and that's why the the thing became an rfc through through really adrian I think that got through yeah. adrian there's also um uh it's it relates to a comment that michael made um which i've 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 tried to address uh which was about the use of integrity only cipher suites and and we had a section in there talking about encrypted client hello and do and these type of things and in sort of in under that umbrella maybe that would fit in there as well uh but you're right i i that slipped my radar mm -hmm. yeah probably when i was writing that text uh it was still true, but uh, things change. Okay. Um, yeah. So the next slide. Um, or do we do we have the input? Or do you want to have a second question? Yeah. Maybe. Maybe. Would you like more contributors for your work, or are you happy with the uh, current set? Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, definitely. We want more con uh, contributors. So currently, it's uh, Thomas Fossati, uh, Michael Richardson, myself. Um, so if if uh, there's interest to uh, contribute that work. We are super open. And yeah. then, of course, uh, ultimately, it's the decision of the chair to decide on who's on the document and who's not. Yeah. So ask the question. Or you can, you, I don't know. You. Uh, or, yeah. Yeah. Judging from the from the comments and the discussion, there might be interest. So I wanted yeah. to just open that up. Cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good feedback. Um, the other thing is, um, since the you that chairs are sort of trying to get this document out of the door um and they are they want to have a document shepherd uh that the chairs don't need to be shepherds of documents through the idf process um specifically the whole is isg processing and so they are looking for shepherd and and i was uh also hoping um maybe someone of you who wants to see sort of like the the how the sausage is made in the IETF uh, wants to see how this whole thing bubbles uh, through the, the the pipeline um and if you if you're interested um come speak to us or to the uh, to the chairs here uh to if you want to be that shepherd so you get to fit, uh, write up uh, a shepherd uh write up there's a, a document with a lot of questions and uh, in, in participating in the interaction with the directorates and the ISG and RFC editor and IANA and, and who wait, 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 wait. So let, let me let me talk a little bit. This is Hank um, about uh, Shepherd's duty. And so uh, starting with the adoption call, I think it's now really wise to assign a shepherd that is not necessarily a chair of a working group. And the duty here is to uh, keep track of the development of the document. So if it's, it's actually quite positive if you have some interest in this document moving while not being a contributor. Uh, because when it's not moving, uh, you, it's actually okay for you to, to uh, poke people starting with the chair, starting going to the authors or to the AD. And, and that, is, that is somehow uh, the opening line for, and then you get some experience with the ITF process. It's not that, that difficult. Uh, there's only one task at the end when there's a successful working group last call to do a AD write-up. So, but I think it's a task that's pretty uh, okay for someone who has an interest but is uh, not, not, not up for contributing, but more for the steering part. So uh, whenever you uh, have that feeling that is something you would like to experience or to do, uh, just approach the authors or the chairs of the Utah. Of the Utah WG. Okay. And I think that was my last slide. Is it my last slide? Yes. Okay. okay, cool. So looking at the agenda. Yeah. Which I can't identify from the name again. Which is probably yeah. Uh, this. Yes. Yeah. Um, Bart, you're next. Oh, yeah, no, excellent. Hello. Hi, my name is uh, Bart Brinkman, and I'm here uh, representing myself, uh, Rohit, who is over there. We're both from Cisco, and then Braden Sanford, who is unfortunately not here from Philips. Um, so, so in this, we're kind of you know, we're going to talk a little, a little bit about the problem we're going to solve, or we we would like to solve. But 
it's important to note that the three of us, we kind of represent the network and the application side. So Rohit and myself, the network, and Braden, the application side. Can I use it? I can also just, oh. just uh, you'll, me. You'll, I'm okay. be your clicker. OK, that, it's an honor. <laughs> um, so what's the problem statement? Um, so we're seeing an acute problem in IoT deployments in um, enterprise environments. And that problem is uh, a problem of silofication. So, so what we see is that we've got an IT network deployed. It typically supports these days Wi-Fi, but also 802.15.4 and BLE type um, um, protocols. So we've got a multi-radio environment installed. And, but what we're seeing is that um, application uh, providers that have a device ecosystem that uh, kind of want to deploy into these environments they end up you know, kind of bringing their own infrastructure. So we have these applications coming with their own infrastructure, coming with their device ecosystem. Then another application provider comes in, you know, same thing. So we're, we're seeing all these parallel infrastructures deployed and, and we're seeing the application vendors having to basically do one-off integrations all the time with their, with their infrastructure providers. Um, obviously, um, this doesn't allow us to scale these ecosystems really well. And it's really a problem for the customers because they have to manage all these parallel uh, infrastructures. And typically these application providers are not really infrastructure vendors. So they don't really do a good job of kind of the management part um, either. Now, um, most of the kind of devices on kind of the bottom side of this picture here, they support a specific radio technology, you know, be it Wi-Fi, be it BLE, be it Zigbee. Um, so that's kind of clearly defined. Um, but what's not clearly defined is how an application can actually talk to these devices over a kind of generic um, IoT infrastructure. Um, so, so what we took on was basically trying to standardize kind of the northbound piece of this. So basically, uh, between application and network and basically look at three um, areas first of all how do we um, kind of onboard these devices so how can how can a network basically tell oh sorry how can an application basically tell a network that hey um, a, a device is coming and uh, it's going to come up on your network and here's how you bring it on uh, the second thing is then, and that's very that's important for IP-based devices, non-IP-based devices. Uh, the second problem here is very much in the kind of non-IP gateway realm, and kind of that's the problem this draft Nipsey um, uh, discusses: is how do you talk to, um, or how do you create a generic interface to devices that don't speak IP, and and Two areas there is control is, is all around kind of how do you establish that bidirectional communication? How do you connect and exchange data? And then telemetry is like, how do you get streaming data of these devices and into applications? So those are um, the areas. So, so we're looking to kind of create a standard around the application to network interface for, uh, for this. And you can go to the next slide. Thank you. So the approach we took, um, is um, we, we, we wanted something that would work for multiple radio technologies. So the radio technologies we typically see in these enterprise environments are you know, obviously Wi-Fi, but also Zigbee, Bluetooth, and, and Thread. But we, we didn't want you know, the standard to stop there. We wanted it to be more extensible, potentially add things like LoRa, LoRaWAN and Ocean and so forth, but we focused mostly on these technologies, because those are the ones that we're typically um, deploying. Um, so the approach was to, to come up with a, an interface that is, I would say, independent of those radio technologies, but extensible to these and other um, new radio uh, technologies. So we end up with kind of a, a, a logical gateway that is serving potentially multiple um, uh, controllers that um, are specific to radio technologies. So the first problem around provisioning, um, we solved um, uh, through SKIM, so an ITF standard, which you probably already know. So system for cross-domain identity management. And we proposed a 
um, uh, a, a new base schema, uh, uh, a new device base schema there that is extensible um, with um, uh, with radio extension. So you kind of define uh, a skim device, and then you will uh, have if depending on the, uh, the the protocols that it supports, it may have Wi-Fi extensions, it may have BLE extensions, um, and and so forth. So so with Skim, you can um, provide a device identity plus any extensions that include the methodology that that or the app the, the protocol that that device supports to uh, bring the device onto a, a a network. So, so you will send the skim object to the gateway. The gateway will return um, a skim ID, and then you can use that identifier going forward to perform NIPSI operations um, uh, on that device. So, and that's kind of the the standard we're uh, or the the draft that we're uh, uh, presenting here. Um, what does NIPSI do? Uh, it's basically a um, RESTful interface. It's also extensible and hierarchical. So it, it'll base, it basically describes a number of um, basic APIs that are, again, extensible with um, attributes that are uh, protocol specific. So, so the APIs kind of up level the communication to a, a device. So there's a connectivity API that allows you to make connections with devices. Um, there's a data API that allows you to exchange um, data, uh, so basically read and write. And then there's a registration API that allows you to register things such as um, pub sub topics, for example. Um, and those pub sub topics um, uh, you can then consume over a telemetry uh, API, which is MQTT based. Uh, those topics could be um, uh, broadcasts from devices, they could be uh, connected mode, just streaming data, or you know any uh, events pertaining to um, devices such as uh, connection state. Next slide, please. So, so this is kind of this kind of shows that in a uh, kind of more sch uh, schematic way, um, basically um, uh, for a skim group or skim device object, we can um, uh, perform these operations. So you can uh, perform the operations on groups of devices or uh, specific devices. The skim object will have connectivity extensions. So um, the connectivity extensions you know, are obviously also extendable, but we've defined, um, uh, have we defined three or four of them? I don't know if we've done thread yet, but um, we haven't done thread yet. So we, we've done BLE, ZigBee, and, and Wi-Fi. There's applications ex extensions as well, which is important. Um, obviously, the gateway will have some uh, role, will have role-based access control here, so to determine which applications can work with which um, uh, with which uh, uh, devices. But you know, an application that onboards a device can obviously add their own um, access control on top of that, you know, to determine which uh, applications can control devices or which applications can receive data. There's potential security extensions as well. And then on, on those devices, we can um, have, we can run connection APIs, um, connection APIs being, um, you know, can, uh, potentially binding if binding is required uh, or a connection if a connection is required. So for example, you know, uh, as a Zigbee will do a join, so a binding, but you don't have to do a connection to a device. A, a BLE device you may or may not bind, but you will definitely connect. Um, and then um, uh, the data API basically allows you to um, exchange data with attributes. So basically you read or write um, or subscribe to an attribute if it, um, if it streams uh, data. And then registrations, you can register topics or you know, even files that um, you want sent to uh, devices if you want to do larger data exchanges. So um, I'm gonna, I have a few examples here of, of, you know, a few call flows of how the APIs with the flow, but I'm gonna pause yeah. before. Yeah, I keep, <laughs> okay, okay, keep going. Um, but we have made the queue. Uh, wait till the end. To the end, okay. okay. All right. Then we can go to the examples. Okay, so a few small examples. 
uh, you know, w what if you want to um, uh, listen to a BLE advertisement? So obviously you'll um, onboard the device first. Um, if you want to listen to an advertisement of a, of a device, um, you'll do that through an onboarding uh, request. Uh, you'll send the skim object to the, uh, to the network, to a gateway function. Uh, you'll get a response with a device ID. Um, and then you can do um, operation or NIPSI operations on that uh, device ID. So you'll um, do a post and you re register a topic. So the topic will be, you know, advertisement for this device. You know, you give it a name. Uh, you'll get um, a response for that. And then um, you will um, basically uh, be able to subscribe, subscribe to that topic. Then as soon as the uh, device starts advertisement, or, or start broadcasting, basically, um, that um, broadcast will be published on that topic. And obviously, you will uh, receive uh, the, the content of that advertisement. Now, what you will receive, so, so this is definitely kind of plumbing, right? So you, in, in no way do we interpret what's actually in that advertisement. So you'll basically get in, a number of bytes, and then it's up to the application to, um, to, to uh, interpret that. Second example, uh, also a simple example, is um, you want to read something and write something to um, uh, a BLE device. Now, it's the same BLE device, so we've already onboarded it, so we're not going to do that again. So um, if we want to read or write uh, to an attribute, we have to connect to the device. So we'll basically uh, post a connection with that ID, that we, the scheme ID for the device. Then the access point will basically connect to that device. Now, BLE has something specific: is that when you want to talk to a, when you want to kind of talk to an attribute on a BLE device, you have to kind of uh, get a connection handle. So what you have to read the database of the device. So that uh, that happens between the access point and the BLE device, and this is called service discovery. Once you've done service discovery the connection response get sent, sent back with a list of services that the device uh, supports. Then you'll pick, you, you'll pick one, right? You'll pick an attribute. Um, and then you'll, um, uh, if you want to read it, you'll do a get, right? That translates into a be read, BLE read, do a response. Um, and you get that at, uh, uh, as a response to the get. Um, and then maybe you want to write something uh, or you want to update the value, right? So then you do a put, which translates into a BLE write and you get the response. And then at the end, you could say, okay, you know, go back to sleep. Um, uh, I'll, uh, I'll disconnect. Uh, next slide, please. So then the last one, uh, Zigbee. So we're, we're doing the read write here as well. We didn't onboard this device here. So what we'll do is we'll um, also onboard this device. We send um, an onboarding request. Now, this time the, the, the Zigbee device has a, 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 a skim, um, a, a skim um, object uh, that has a Zigbee uh, extension. So then uh, we will allow the Zigbee device to bind or to join the network. So we'll uh, do a binding. And I think that there's one error that should be pointing the other direction because the Zigbee device will join. Uh, we will not join the, Z the Zigbee device. So the Zigbee device joins and we'll have a, um, uh, a response. And then again, we could do the same gets. Um, um, in the, when we, we, will, we will get the node ID, the pan ID of the, of the Zigbee network. So the same gets will allow us to kind of communicate with the Zigbee device. So do a read and a write. As uh, like we do in the BLE device. Here we don't have to connect because the Zigbee device is on the mesh, um, so there's no connection for uh, for Zigbee. So so it is. There's two things as an, from an application perspective. You 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 we we kind of make the gen the applications uh, available generically, but uh, you do have to know you know, you know which radio technology you talk to. If you do a connect on a Zigbee device, then you're going to get a failure because you know, you don't have to connect. To a Zigbee device, so so the application does have to kind of understand, you know, what type of uh, radio technology that the the, um, uh, the device is using, and use the appropriate um, APIs. And I think we're there. Wonderful. So we have two uh, individuals in the group in the queue. Sorry. 
Uh, hi, Wei Pan from Huawei. Um, thank you very much for this presentation. And uh, this topic is very meaningful. And uh, um, the silo things are uh, is actually the pain point of deploying IoT in the in, in industry uh, enterprise uh, networks. And we all see uh, we also see this uh, kind of thing. And uh, uh, but I have two comments for this. First uh, is um, your name of this is non-IP control. And uh, uh, I, I feel it's, it's uh, IP is the reason of this, of the fault to make the silo things. But uh, I don't think uh, IP is the reason. So maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Name change. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah we're, good. we're good with name change. Yeah. And uh, second, um, you know, um, I'm not familiar with Scheme, but uh, I think uh, um, you bro bring this here, and I believe um, this pro this solution is uh, is good. Uh, but I still want to to know more about the you know every solution has some cost and uh, limitations. So I I I need to know. I want to know something about this. Uh, maybe negative or disadvantage part of this solution. Maybe you can share something. Yeah, um, Skim is an IETF standard as well. So yeah, um, yeah. I know can, I I can do do do, do uh, deep to that yeah, later. I, yeah, I think the advantage, the reason we chose Skim is because you know it's been used already in the industry at scale, right? So we know that you know that it's scaled scales and and there's a very active community that. Uh, uses it, so we we definitely saw the uh, the uh, the kind of uh, the the synergies there, and I think the Skim working group also sees that you know this is um, synergistic with you know what they're doing on specifically more users, right? The group object we have in common, um, Nipsey itself, we 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 looked at the in, and there's there's various REST API, for example, BLE has a REST API, for example, but we we kind of we wanted it. We wanted to up level that and that more because we don't see that the BLE REST API, for example, is being used in many cases. So we wanted to have something that's, you know, kind of meaningful, you know, outside of you know a, a single radio technology as well. So yeah, I mean that has probably its advantages and this is disadvantages mm, yeah. because we kind of trying to make it work for everything. But that's why we kind of went with the extensive with the extensions for radio technology, so we could. You know, um, you know, if we needed to put radio technology specific attributes in there, that we could. Yeah, yeah, we can maybe talk more yeah. because you know, um, if we need to deploy this, I want to know uh, which scenario will this uh, solution won't fit. Uh, this is my focus. Um, that's a good yeah. question. I'd love to get your feedback on that yeah. because you know that's we can still improve it, obviously. Yeah. Michael Richardson, um, thank you for these slides. They're very good. I'm sorry I missed your side meeting yesterday. I thought it was today. Um, could you, I have a couple of comments, but could you clarify for us sort of like uh, get attribute and then it responds with the data attribute response and that, mm. that I guess it's the fourth line. What is the encoding of that value? Is it a Zigbee encoding? It's, uh, it's hex, it's, yeah. It's but it's 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 whatever the Zigbee spec says for that attribute. Correct. Yes. Okay. So the application has to know it's speaking to Zigbee thing uh, there. Yes. So in effect, I mean Zigbee runs over, uh, and and you haven't you haven't clarified if it's Zigbee or Zigbee IP. I guess it's the one, the the not IP the one, that, yes. the one right. Yeah. So you might characterize this as Zigbee over HTTP. Pretty much. Right, yeah, yeah. Or, or, uh, or BLE, BLE over, over HTTP. HTTP. Yeah. And I think that actually may contribute to uh, more understanding of what we're doing. That's a very, right? good, that's a very good point. So uh, I think that's interesting. The other, other thing I'll, I'll say, which is a kind of an aside, is that one of the concepts of is that you give each Zigbee or BLE device, you give its own IP, you, you give it its own IPv6 IID in a slash 64 that your gateway has. And so actually you address, you can address it directly through the gateway yeah, we translating. Use a, yeah, we okay. use a UUID now, but that's also not a bad right. idea. But yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's an idea, yeah. but it doesn't always fly yeah. and I can see why you might not do it everywhere. Um, so having said all of that, um, 
Uh, huh? That's kind of cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What did I, what I just said about V6? Yeah, you we, you <laughs> want to do that, right? I mean, because eventually the, then you can route to it and eventually you can, you can just realize that the devices get replaced with real V6 things and you still talk to them over, yeah, you know, things, idea. right? So, and we've talked about that in IoT ops, by the way, before in Kiernan's document about industrial IoT, uh, which I think is not really get, gotten very far. Um, but, and the question for you, Warren, is I don't think we can adopt this in this working group based upon the charter. Do you think we can? Okay, well, that's the answer I wanted to hear. Okay. I, I, what about the non-IP? Well, that, that's, but, but on the right-hand side, it's all IP addresses. So on the, anyway, let, we can talk about the V6 thing later. I want to know where we're going to do this work, okay? If we agree to change the name to, you know, IoT over HTTP, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Well, this is it. So we, we, so we were excluded from doing some protocol stuff in this working group, but actually I think this is exactly the kind of thing we should be doing in this working group, but I didn't get on my way in the charter. So uh, that's why I'm asking you, Warren, and, and maybe. But uh, the other reason is because with my ASDF hat on, I now am fully convinced it doesn't belong in ASDF, and, but, uh, but also that it's really good work that we absolutely need to find a home for. So um, that's why I'm asking the question. Yeah, we are we a little bit um, on time. Uh, so yeah, tight on time. Up, so, hurry up. Um, I mean, somebody should carefully look at the charter and see if maybe we can fit it in here. I don't know. I think it would be good if somebody does the work. I don't know where, but like, it seems, I don't know. See if we can like squiggle it in. Hopefully, nobody else is listening. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, Hannes. Uh, it's being recorded. Yeah. yeah. He's going to walk in the back and um, this idea is obviously not new, uh, as, as you can imagine, like people came up with that idea of tunneling, uh, sort of end to end. Having said that, um, one of the challenge this work will be facing is that the companies who sell, deploy these controllers, these middle boxes, gateways, they didn't do that as an accident. <laughs> um, <laughs> They did this as a control point to make their product sticky. Uh, if you figure out how to get that away, that would be fantastic for the consumers. Uh, but uh, it's going to be rough. The, so, okay, yeah, no, yeah, uh, later. Uh, <laughs> the the second thing is, and it's a, it's a business question. It's like not something you can solve anyway as an engineer. Uh, the other thing is, you may want to look at um, some other work and a different design of exactly this stuff that. Um, OMA published as a, they call it the gateway specification, um, which uh, this gentleman over there was one of the contributor to that, uh, to that work. And it may give you some ideas on how other uh, people solved it, also using a REST API and also dealing with uh, uh, devices. It's just a different uh, data point. And there, there are numerous other examples on, on similar attempts. Yeah, uh, with regards to the, um, if I can respond to the, um, um, Really quick, because we yeah. over time. We're, we're, we're four minutes over. Yeah. Oh, sorry. So I can't. Uh, well, quickly. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, clearly, I mean, most of the uh, the the people that are deploying the infrastructure piece, the the controller pieces, are. I mean, they're not in the business of doing that. Their business is the application. So, and our customers are really looking at infra real infrastructure vendors to go after this. So. So I think there's definitely a need there. Okay. Okay. Right. Thank you. And Jeffrey can see you. Can we hear you? Okay. Hello. Yeah. Can you hear me? Also that. Okay. Oh, no. Okay. So I'll talk twice as fast since we've got a little bit less time. Um, so first of all, um, I'd like to, uh, I'm Jeff Cooper and I'm from Intel Corporation. Uh, I'm also the co-chair of the Fido Alliance IoT Technical Working Group. Um, my other co-chair is, is here online, um, Giri Manjam. Um, and I'd like, so, like to also um, call out to Hannes, who's a, who's a, a signatory to the uh, Fido, uh, the FDO spec. Um, so you'll see his name in there, and, and, and one of the things we wanted to do was to have the 
FDO spec reflect a, a wide spectrum of the industry and, and HANA certainly helped us to do that. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So just to explain where we are, um, FDO is FIDO device onboard. It's an onboarding protocol. I'll go and describe it in a minute. Um, we've had some larger adoption of it. Um, the Dell Edge group has adopted it for a, a number of platforms um, and that's part of their um, native edge uh, effort. So if you, if you look in there and you see Dell native edge, you'll actually, that's actually FDO under the wraps. Um, there are some other stuff like servers and customer stuff, but we know that it's all really about the onboarding. Um, IBM has a project um, with their Open Horizon project, uh, their Open Horizon site, uh, working with the German government. Um, I think it's called Agro Regio. Um, Exxon has been talking about the work that they've been doing in their labs. Um, there's you know, presumably follow on to that that's coming, but at the moment they've been doing a lot of really interesting work in figuring out how FDO can make your onboarding of your, your procedures for intake of IoT devices and getting them up on the network to go faster. Meanwhile, we have some independent implementations that have come out. Um, Intel's implementation is distributed through LF Edge. That's written, the server components are in Java, the device component is in C. Obviously there's an x86 focus, but it has actually run on other processors, for example, ARM. Um, Vin CSS is a company from Vietnam that has um, uh, started with the Intel code, but actually has moved it over to Go um, and, and has their own work on it. And, and they're running on microprocessors. So we have it now, the spectrum from microprocessors up to server type products. Um, and Red Hat has an implementation in Rust. Um, we've been running with the same specification for a while now, FDO 1.1, that's the specification. We held it steady so that the implementers would have a good implementation target. Um, so what we've been doing instead is we've been answering questions by writing app notes. Um, there are seven of them out there. One of them hasn't quite been posted yet, but it's been approved. And then the latest thing that we've done is we've done the um, a spec for how to put FDO credentials on the TPM. They don't have to be on a TPM, but if you do have a TPM, it would help if everybody did it the same way. And then um, we've started certification within the FIDO Alliance, um, and there's actually a, a conformance testing going on as we speak. Uh, there are a number of companies that are actually using the internet to go and interconnect their implementations and, and seeing what happens and who read what into the spec and that kind of thing. I'm sure you've all seen that before. Um, and certification will follow. Um, at the moment, it's lower security levels. It's really basically um, you, you explain what you've been doing and then you get security advice on it. Next slide. This is going to be a nutshell of, of how it works. I'll go quick. Um, in the factory, the, the device is um, mated cryptographically to a set of credentials. Some of the credentials go in the device. Some of the credentials go in an object called an ownership voucher. Now, there is, um, there is such a thing as a voucher in, uh, in ITF uh, RFC 8366. Our ownership voucher is different. Um, so you'll have to look in the FDO spec if you want to get all the details, but it is it actually evolved independently and it's a separate um, it, separate object with a similar similar kind of purpose. Um, the ownership voucher goes to the target cloud and it'll go through the supply chain. Um, and that would follow, say, the, the order ac uh, path, the paperwork path for a device. And the device goes directly to where it's going to be installed. So when the ownership voucher arrives at the target cloud, uh, there's going to be this issue of how does the device find the target cloud that has the ownership voucher. The way that works is there's a static address uh, in the device which identifies one or more rendezvous services. The, these are simple servers. They do something very simple, similar to DNS, but an, at an application level. Uh, the target cloud registers the ownership voucher with the rendezvous service. When the device wakes up, it goes to the rendezvous service and it finds the, the owner that claims to own it. And then all of the, um, the work is done in step five uh, where the owner authenticates, sorry, the device authenticates using a device certificate, the owner authenticates using the ownership voucher, um, and then there's a, um, you know, a, a, the usual key exchange and crypto tunnel, and uh, then there's a, a sub-protocols 
that are used to actually onboard the device. And step six, the idea is that the device should now be in operation. Um, so it's showing you know, temperature data flowing up to the cloud. Um, that, that's really just to, to show you that, that after you're done, you shouldn't have to touch the device again. Um, okay, so let's go on to the next slide. And I think there's a copy of this slide uh, in the deck, so you might have to do two advances. Here we go. Um, so there are some IETF protocols that people might be familiar with. Um, they're good protocols, they're out there. Um, it's, this one is a little bit different in some ways and a little bit the same. Uh, so of course we use IETF objects. Um, we send our data over TLS, uh, uh, sorry, over TCP. Um, we can also use TLS. Um, we don't actually rely on TLS, we'll get to that. Um, we use Cbor, Cose, and Eat. So, so we're using these um, signing structures and, and these uh, IoT encoding mechanisms. Um, the discovery of the server, um, the, um, we use this rendezvous mechanism. So one of the things we were concerned about is that we wanted to avoid requiring that people change the network. So you guys all work in the networking parts of the, uh, of the organization, right? And, and, and that's IETF, but in, the, in a more of an application world, if somebody's out there and saying, hey, can you stand up IoT devices? Getting changes to the network seems to be the long pole for him. So we said, no, we didn't want to do that, you, but you can put up as many application servers as you want, as quickly as you want. So, so we ended up doing it that way. So that's where the rendezvous protocol comes from. And that's two of the protocols of the three protocols that we have in FDO. Um, we do pass data through the supply chain and we have this ownership voucher. It's um, one voucher per device, just like in the ITF vouchers, but the ownership voucher actually routes through the supply chain. And so if you wanna, if you wanna be manufacturing to stock, um, you can have ownership vouchers that are sitting a, at a distributor and nobody has bought those devices yet, and they can be routed incrementally either to other distributors or to end users by signing the ownership vouchers and endorsing them over uh, incrementally. So that's actually a, a, a major flexibility piece in the ownership voucher that we have. Um, then we do mutual authentication uh, with a device certificate, but then we use the ownership voucher to authenticate the, the owner side of it, the, 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 the cloud that's onboarding the device. Um, the encryption, very similar to TLS, but we implemented the crypto inside of F FDO, not in TLS. Perhaps if we had the, uh, the lighter weight TLS spec that Hannes was talking about earlier today, we would have gone more for TLS, but we didn't have it at the time. Um, for onboarding, we actually have a set of sub protocols. Uh, I think that's really an important piece. So we actually have a whole repo where you can actually do contribs and, and, and submit new protocols. Um, for, for running the actual onboarding piece of FDO. And then, um, yes, it can run over non-IETF protocols and there's been a little bit about it, but in fact, it runs over TCP most of the time. Um, and uh, Gary, for example, has done some work uh, with his company in, in, in non-IP protocols and there are some other people who've taken a look at that. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, we have this specification for FDO in TPM. So this is saying, how do you put the credentials for FDO into a TPM? Obviously, this implies that you have a TPM and you don't have to have a TPM to run FDO. So the idea is, well, if people are using TPM and a lot of the, the, the kinds of platforms that are currently doing FDO have TPMs, it would be really nice if they did it the same way. Um, why would that be important? Well, uh, one of the ideas is that uh, a TPM manufacturer could actually put the, the FDO credentials in the TPM when it ships the part. And so if you wanted to convert a device to support FDO, you could actually just change the TPM part that you put onto the device and it would now automatically support FDO. Um, the idea of being able to discover whether you have credentials. So if you're saying a Linux startup script and you're saying, do I have FDO credentials? And do they tell me to run FDO? Um, it'd be really nice if you could have a standard way of doing that. So it, we, we provide that. Um, and obviously we have credentials so you can run FDO based on this thing. Um, and then we have to be able to update the credentials so you can run FDO again. One of the consequences of running the transfer ownership to protocol within FDO is that you get a new set of credentials that nobody ever has. There's a new ownership voucher. You can continue to run, you can run FDO again. Uh, so we have to support that capability. Um, 
And, and then we want to be able to, to restrict access to the credentials unless you're actually ready to run FTO. Um, so the basic idea is that when the system comes up, the TPM is open and allows you to, to see those registers and to, to look at the credentials. And then the idea is that there's some software early in the boot process that examines the credentials, performs FTO if it's needed to be run, and otherwise locks the credentials in the TPM until the next boot. And um, let's see. Let's go on to the next slide. Um, and let's see, uh, the, there, there are several registers within the TPM that are allocated. Um, the, the, they're, the, 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 they're allocated differently depending on basically the way the TPM protections have to work. So there's one set of registers that's used for keys and secrets. Uh, there's another set of registers only for the active flag because you have to be able to tell whether FDO is supposed to run. Uh, and then all the other FDO parameters are put in another one. And then there's actually a register allocated so that if you have TPM, if you have FDO credentials in a TPM chip, uh, the vendor can put the ownership voucher in the device. Um, and this is something you would only do at the very beginning of life of a device. Then once you, then you would take the ownership voucher out, delete it from the TPM and it would run independently just like um, the other kinds of vouchers. Um, and so we're actually uh, interested in having reviewers of this. If anybody's interested in uh, taking a look at it, it's actually posted on the Vito Alliance website. Um, and uh, please, please go ahead and read it and review it to us. And we're very interested to see what you think of it. And let's see, next slide. That's it. Okay, any questions? Very quickly, we are, because we are over official time. Oh, but... Michael here. So uh, two things. Does it have to be a TPM or can it be a secure element? Um, well, the spec is based on this TPM spec. My guess is that depending on the secure element, you could be doing other things. FDO does not require a TPM. You can use right. a secure element with FDO. So, so I just want to make you aware the NIST NCCOE IoT onboarding effort, which is close to conclusion, but not mm -hmm. yet dead. Um, so one of the things we want to do is what you just said, standardize how uh, specifically cr initial credentials are stored into secure elements uh, and TPMs. Um, and uh, some of the higher level processes around the factories that do that. So I'd really love to have uh, FDO come and kind of be involved in that um, because uh, it would be nice to have some more uh, uh, variety in the in the opinions okay. there. Okay. So thanks, and we I'll look at your documents. Thank thanks. you. Great to see you, Chip. Um, can you send a mail to the list with the pointer to the to the document you want the review on? Happy to do the review. Um, Yes, actually, it's going to be posted on the FIDO Alliance website, but there's been a little bit of a delay. It was approved a couple okay. of weeks ago. Um, so it will actually appear in the standard place, the same place where the FTO spec is. Oh, cool. Okay, perfect. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and thanks for the presentation. Um, we are three minutes over. Thank you for the patience. Thank you for all the contributions and the lively discussions. Thank you, Jeff, for the remote attendance. And uh, see you all at uh, 119 in Brisbane, I think. Thanks, guys. I know. Actually, all right. Actually, it's still here.